Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Rosalind Trinidad, D, 5, 9. Hello team. Today we have a very exciting episode planned because this is the first of our special Patreon guest episodes. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Rosalind Trinidad, one of our incredible top tier patrons. Rosalind is, of course, a fan of Young Justice and a longtime listener to Whelmed, and at the incredibly generous Patreon tier at which she has chosen to support our show, she's gotten the chance to be a special guest here on Whelmed. Outside of being one of our patrons, Rosalind is a student, a direct support professional working to help adults with disabilities, and is considering pursuing a medical career in radiography, a path that makes her a real-life superhero. And we're very excited to welcome her to the show. Rosalind, thank you so much for your support, and welcome to Whelmed. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to support because you guys have expanded my knowledge of dc to the point where i'm like am i fam (laughs) that's so nice thank you so much before we begin i want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to young justice including all three seasons of the show so far the comics the video game and even the audio play so if you have not seen read or played all of the material and are spoiler wary consider this your warning And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in our intro, uh, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? So I am, like you mentioned, a student. I am currently in community college to graduate with an associate's in radiography. Um, It's basically to become an x-ray technician or technologist, depending on the way the place that I work in will kind of name me because some people technologist is more of a upper than a technician just depends on where but I have been in school for a very long time and have never figured out what I wanted to do so I just thought you know what I just need to find a job that um helps me help people but it's something also like a job that also makes me use my brain So I thought this could be really great because it's taking photographs of people in a, in a way that it's not considered normal. And obviously you're trying to figure out what's wrong with people. Why do they need to see certain images of their body to, um, so that doctors can diagnose what's wrong so that we can further help people be better with my current job. We also do that because we help people live decent lives with assistance. That's really great. Honestly, just people who decide to pursue in their life that they want to just help people in these ways are amazing. Seriously, mm. I <laughs> I am <laughs> baffled by what people are able to do. <laughs> You'd also be like also grateful when you're around people things that you do because it makes you think like, no, yeah, I'm super grateful that I am who I am today because if I couldn't do the things that I like to do, it'd be super frustrating and by helping people that can't do the things that they can do, you're also opening the door for them to do the things that they never thought yeah. they could do. It's being, it's finding a way to give those things back to people who have just not, because of, for whatever reason, just, you know, need a little help to do whatever it is that they want to do. That's amazing. Seriously. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am just, I, I'm amazed <laughs> by the cool things that people do out there in the world to help people. It's amazing. Real life superheroes. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, But speaking of which, uh, when did you first see Young Justice? Speaking of superheroes, did you watch it on DVD or on Netflix or did you watch it all the way back when it originally aired? (laughs) So the way I found, and I say found because I literally found the show on YouTube (laughs) through the half and halves of, like not halves and halves, but like people used to put episodes up on YouTube. They would do like part one and part yeah, two. Yeah, those very, those and very old days. It was, yeah, very. Um, I actually saw like half of season one through YouTube. And then I um, watched the rest of the show on the original release. And it got me hooked from the second episode. Like I have to say, I am... Um, I, during that time, I was graduating from middle school. That's how old 
<laughs> and I think uh, middle school, it's that's a very old. Um, and it was the in-between phase of like, I was feeling very nostalgic of the old stuff that you, I used to like. And I was looking up clips of Justice League animated and listening to the intro song of Justice League Unlimited because of that song. It's, it's a good awesome. song. It's a very good thing. And song. Um, it really is. And then on my recommendations came Young Justice episode one, part one. And at first I thought, is this fan <laughs> me? Like, is this even real? Like, what the heck? I've never heard of this. And then I click on it and I'm like, oh no, this is not fan me. This is actually real. And I just binged the ha- first half of the season, I believe. I think I got up to where Connor and McGann were in the prison in Bell Red. Terrors. That was the last episode. And I was like, wait, there's no, <laughs> where, where's the rest of it? I had to literally look it up and was like, oh, so this is a real show. <laughs> and it's on Cartoon Network. So there we go. Going back to like Cartoon Network or Teen Titans used to be in Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. And um, I just deep dive back into DC after so that. So great. Never <laughs> left. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited and all of those. So what was your history with DC and like with comics in general before watching Young Justice? So I never really got into the comics until after Young Justice. My introduction to DC was through the shows. Um, I really didn't have that much exposure because my parents were um, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. So in reality, the only thing that I could say that my mom gave to me was that she was a really big fan at her at like when she was young of the Super Friends. Like she loved the, those cartoons. And when they ever would come on a boomerang, she was like, oh, my God, I used to watch that when I was younger and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, they're so <laughs> old. <laughs> It kind of solidified for me because after watching Justice League through Cartoon Network and then Teen Titans, I sort of fell in love with the story of people who can do impossible things and that they actually have problems just as much as we do. They can do amazing things and yet they still go through relationships. They still go through dealing with friendships and betrayals and normal stuff that you would think you know these gods didn't have to deal with because they're they're better technically better because they can do so much more incredible stuff yeah but that's not true the stories i feel like the best stories about superheroes is when they're struggling (laughs) to balance everything out it's it's great because it makes you feel better for yourself (laughs) when you're not able to do everything at once if Superman can't do it, then that's okay. I, d- I definitely feel that. I definitely feel that a lot of the time. The stories that I know that I love in comics are I'm like, can they can they sit down and talk about their feelings for a minute? Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm like, punching yes. giant robots is fun, but talking about your feelings <laughs> is even more fun. <laughs> I feel like the investor does such an amazing job with that aspect. You know, it's able to give us the action-packed, movies movie like scenes and yet we can have an episode where we're discussing about our feelings because you know what we have feelings and we need to talk about them and that's awesome too yes absolutely which actually leads us perfectly into what we're talking about for today because when we first started planning this episode this special patreon guest episode uh the topic that you brought up as being one of your favorite things about this show is the way that it makes characters with superhuman abilities who can do impossible things with their phenomenal powers still feel real and human and relatable. So we're going to jump right into that since you brought it up already, Um, which is just this show is about teenagers who can fly and lift cars uh, and shoot energy beams and punch giant robots. Uh, And yet they all still still feel very relatable. So what do you think it is about these characters in particular and the way the show is written that makes that so true? What stands out to you? For me, I have to say 
the first time I realized what this show was really about was episode two when Superman did not react well to Connor. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Superman is not going to take Connor in? That was like my, that, that was the question yeah. in my head. I'm like, he's literally flying away. You're not going to take him to Smallville? You're not going to have him meet your parents? Eventually. It just what? had to take, it took us some time to get there. I literally had to yeah, I literally had to pause because I was so used to watching Smallville and you know, that show. Clark, even though he was like off balance most of the time, he always did the right thing for other people. And this Superman was like, No, I didn't ask for this. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, that is so real. Because I think back, like, if I, my age now at 25, to have a kid that's 16 come to me and say, I'm your clone and I don't have a home. And I'm like, okay, uh, someone take care of this child, please, because I don't even have the resources to take care of myself. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was very relatable. And I felt like if you're willing to make Superman a deadbeat dad, you're going places where um, you're going to take these characters to places we've never seen. One example is Batman and his relationship with Robin in season one. Um, and I think the particular episode was when Calder um, was having trouble associating his time or his head between Atlantis and Earth. And not Earth, but land. And Robin felt like he was being set aside and Bruce felt that and what he did was he didn't ignore it he was like let's have some fun even though he made it seem like it was training <laughs> yeah that was just the the baseline like Bruce is acting like a dad which is something that we kind of see sometimes but it's like he's really caring and then Superman is like he's supposed to be the archetype of I care for everyone. And he's like, oh, no, no, I can't. That was, that was yeah. great. I absolutely agree. I think, I think we've talked about it before, but yeah, Young Justice does that really interesting thing with kind of paralleling those two adult characters in this teen oriented show of being like, Batman's a good dad and Superman doesn't know how to be a dad, which isn't what people expect from comics. But when you look at these <laughs> characters and how they fit into this world, it makes perfect sense because it's like Batman is a guy who has adopted like There's five different sidekicks He's over the years. So of course, he has the ability to be a dad. Why else is he adopting all these Robins? Um, whereas Superman is kind of this independent uh, adult on his own for all that Batman is called like the Dark Knight and he works alone. Superman's the one who doesn't have 10 sidekicks following in his wake. Uh, and it's also that idea that Superman on the show didn't choose this idea with, with Superboy existing in his life. Batman chose to adopt Robin and he chose to be a father in someone's life. And Superman is like, I had no say in this and I do not know what to do with it. And I agree that that feels very honest in that like Superman who is the great boy scout that he is supposed to be d just is like, I don't know how to deal with this. I didn't plan for this. Nobody told me this is what I was doing today. Yeah, and there's a point in Superman's history where he's planning to always be alone until he finally, you know, decides, you know, my love for Lois is so much that I want to bring her into my life, even though I know it's risky. It isn't until then. Superman always thinks he's going to be alone. And so Connor comes into his life and it's like, yeah, no, you're not alone. And that breaks that vow that Superman makes to himself. And he's not ready to break that. And I feel like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. If you make that choice and somebody takes that choice from you, you would feel a certain type of way too. Like that's, this is not what I asked for. But I also feel like with the main characters is also so well done. And I think, Superboy is like a perfect dichotomy of angry teenager that just wants to be loved by the person that he deems his father. I 
love that this show in presenting those ideas does not have them be stagnant ideas. They grow and change and that relationship that those two characters have shifts so much over the course of the series so far. Like, I love that the solution they come up with is Superman being like, I can't be your dad and I've never I was never supposed to be your dad and I can't be your dad but I think we can be brothers I think that works and them kind of finding that equilibrium of like this is a relationship both of us can deal with and understand uh that works and makes sense I think is really an interesting way to take these characters and make them work in this universe yeah I find that when it comes to Superboy like even his relationship with McGann, like I mentioned it in my email, like I was like, I don't know. <laughs> He's obviously the better person because he forgave her for what happened. And I don't did he forgive her, but they kind of restarted their relationship going forward. And now in season three, they're engaged. And I'm like, but that just tells me that there's a certain part of me that Superboy highlights that it's like you don't trust people very often and when people break that trust it's hard to get back to it and the Superboy just shows me that um, you know people are going to break your trust and you have to find it in you to love them again for who they are not for who you want them to be. Connor wanted McGann to be someone that respected boundaries and in that moment in time she she wasn't and um, he took it to the point where, like, I don't want to be with you if you're not going to do that. And it took her understanding what he was saying for her to realize that, yeah, this is not okay. And once she changed and realized, you know, I can't keep doing this, Connor was like, yeah, I'm glad you're seeing seeing this. But he never tried to force it upon her. He was willing to cut off the relationship, but that was it. He wasn't going to tell the league that she was doing these things. She was just like, I'm going to distance myself because in his head space, I don't think he wanted to put himself in the savior mode for her. She needed to come to this realization. And I think it's so perfect because he's allowing her to change. He's not forcing it. He's allowing her to figure this out on her own. Just the way that he kind of figured out on his own that Lex wasn't all that great, even though he was giving him the attention that he wanted from Superman. People need to see things their own through their own eyes and not be forced to see it because you can't really force someone to see something that when their eyes are closed to it. I I definitely agree. I think part of everyone everybody knows that I I love my Superboy and McGann ship. I think they're adorable, but I do appreciate <clears throat> that with those those moments of those rough struggles in their relationship the fact that like the time skips exist in the show and that time moves forward on this show allowed like the space and time for that growth to happen i think a lot of other shows mm-hmm. might have might have like tried to do that storyline and wrapped it up too fast in a lot of ways that would have made it feel disingenuous and not have as much power as it does cuz like that the fact that there is time and space between the very end of season two when they're like kind of being like, okay, maybe we're figuring things out to the point in season three where they've gotten back together and have gotten and get engaged at the start of season three. I think the fact that those couple of years exist between those seasons makes that so much more powerful and makes it work. Like there is the implication of like, oh, we have taken time separately and together to work through this concept and work through whatever struggles and whatever pain we have caused and figured out a way to move forward. And I know some people are, were probably annoyed that all that happened off screen, but I think the show does it still does a good job of portraying that those things happened. Even if we didn't see them because we can't follow every moment of these characters, there are too many characters and there's too much story to do that. Uh, It still does a good job of kind of filling in those gaps of like, the work has been put in by these characters in this time to regain trust or to heal whatever has happened between these characters. And it does that with a lot of different characters. <laughs> We're just talking about these two for a minute. I agree. It works really well to kind of explore all of those very complicated ideas that a lot of other cartoons wouldn't wouldn't even try because it takes so much time and effort to make it work. Yeah. 
And speaking of like relationship dynamics, the fact that Wally and Artemis are like one of my like between um McGann and Connor and Artemis and Wally, I have to say Artemis and Wally are my favorite. Totally fair. Only because I feel like their relationship, even through Wally's quote unquote death, <laughs> because I really don't believe he's dead. <laughs> it's so real. They hate they didn't like each other because they saw something that in in each other that, you know, they liked, but they didn't want to like it. <laughs> and then um when they got together, it was like, yeah, this this is perfect. This works. And then the phase of the relationship where they lose each other and the fact that we get to see Artemis actually grieve. Yeah. It's so perfect because even though I would have wished that on season three they would have brought back Wally, it works because we get to see Artemis grow on her own. And I, you know, we always complain as as a female, I always complain that they never take time with female characters to let them grow and be their own person outside of their own relationships. And this is the one time where we get to see Artemis be her own person. She's making her own choices. And even though she's resi- I applaud her for resisting the peer pressure for everybody saying, you know, you should be with Will. And then I'm like, no. <laughs> no, no. no. Um, and then she sort of gave in, but then realized, you know what? No, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. And that's okay. That's great that she acknowledged that, that she's still not ready, even though it's been two years since Wally died. And that we get to see that we get a female character who's not ready for a relationship after the end of a very traumatic end to um, her, her first relationship. And even though everybody's ready for her to jump in, she's not. She's not ready because she, she loved this guy. Yeah. And it's okay to be like, I'm not ready. And you know what? I don't even see Will like that. Like, it's it's okay for her to see that. Yeah. Like, Will's my, like, Will is her brother-in-law. And Will is still very much in love with Cheshire. Yes. Which makes me think, Cheshire, you need to get your butt back home. <laughs> even though I kind of figured in my head canon, I'm pretty sure she is afraid of everybody. She's double-crossed coming back to, like take revenge for her family so she'd rather be out there tying up blue sentence than being home being like hoping that nobody comes to her doorstep thinking they can have her family that's the only reason i could think that it's the reason why she's not home yeah i am very excited to hopefully see where they take all of that in season four because i absolutely agree i was just having a conversation with someone uh with Ariel, friend of the show, Ariel Horn, a couple of weeks ago where we were like, okay, but the only reason that makes sense for Cheshire not to be here is because for all of those reasons that you just said, because like, I fully agree and understand that like Cheshire has issues with family and has trauma surrounding the entire concept of what a happy family looks like. And I, I heard dad was did a number. Yeah. On like I get it. I get that Cheshire is a person who runs from things sometimes, but also I think it would be interesting if not only just that, that is like, okay, can we just get you to some superhero therapy? Uh, she's like, also, you know, we kind of betrayed the League of Assassins a while back. Uh, we kind of need to, <laughs> we should maybe deal with that before I just try to have a normal life. <laughs> yeah. But life is messy. Yeah. And that's actually the great part. Yeah. Because normally we don't get to see, like, at least me, because I don't really follow the comics like that. I usually like to watch, like, the movies and the shows. And the shows are very time constraint there's a beginning and the end and there's not much change in between movies can only get so far before they start restarting everything (laughs) um so for me it's like um i read up that they gave superman a son and then they were like let's restart everything back to 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 the beginning and i'm like but you just gave him a son same thing with batman and i'm like they're so afraid i feel like some of the comic book writers are so afraid of taking these characters to the next stage of their lives. It's like, I'm so glad Brandon and Greg are not. Yeah. Like we're seeing Superman. He has the kid. Yeah. Bruce Wayne potentially has a kid too. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be interesting when Bruce finds out. I really want to see that. Yeah. Even though I doubt we will because, <laughs> you know, they, 
Brandon and Greg have this thing where it's like, I feel like they're not going to give us the normal, oh, here's your kid, because we've already seen that, like, in movies, yeah. at least. So what they're probably going to do is like, oh, we've already seen that. So let's show you what it's like for him to have him at, I don't know. I hope it's not 13, because then that means a 13-year time skip. I'm not ready for that. I need some time in between. I <laughs> But what you say, what you were saying about comics is is often really true. Comics as a medium have this kind of mentality that is not always true, but a lot of the time comics are so focused on the idea that there has to be a status quo that is maintained so that like new readers don't get confused, even though that's impossible at this point in some ways, because there's just so much. These stories are so iconic yeah. anyways, I feel. So it becomes this kind of idea that, like, no big shift in comic status quo is allowed to stay around that long. So you have that thing where, like, every couple of years, DC or Marvel or any of kind of the big comics the companies that have, like, a big interconnected universe are like, what if we just start over uh, <laughs> kind of thing, which can sometimes lead to really interesting stories and really interesting events, depending on how it's approached. But a lot of the time it's like, but we were just starting to like, these two characters finally got together or this character was finally growing into their own person. And I wanted to see more of that. Um, so it's a weird balance yes. that comics have to walk. And I, I always wish that there was some way that we could find that balance more easily. But I think part of it is like, I really I like I love those offshoot storylines where comics are kind of like this might not be part of the main continuity, but we're going to just do some stuff for a couple of months. And like having those stories where a lot of things get to happen are really, really interesting. So, yeah, I really love that Young Justice decided to do that and decided like time passes in our universe. Things change in our universe. Also, some things that you think are true from the comics won't be true because we decided, uh, but in ways that make perfect sense that aren't yeah. like arbitrary. Like I was recently talking to somebody about like the concept of Nightwing and Young Justice being just Robin's natural evolution and how he kind of just apparently off screen kind of went to Batman and was like, I kind of want to do my own thing and not become the next Batman. And Batman Ooh. was like, sure, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> and that's fine. Whereas like, and I think that was, that was Bruce's grand design. Yeah. Because if you remember the episode where they were all talking about who to add into the league, Wonder Woman came at Bruce's neck and said, you indoctrinated this kid into crime fighting at the age of nine. Did you want him to become like you? And he was like, no, I didn't. I didn't want him to become like me. And that's why I did this. He wanted this kid to have the, um, the relief of knowing that his parents' murder is in jail. Yeah. Bruce never got that. Yeah. And so that's the trauma that lingered in Bruce. And so by giving Dick that ability to say, you have the ability to do these things, here is, here's how you do it. He pushed Dick away from the Batman mind frame of, because this happened to me, this is why I'm doing this. But you know what it feels like to have justice vindicated for you. So you do it for other people for that reason. And that's the Nightwing version of it. Yeah. It just so awesome because Bruce, I don't think ever wanted Dick to be obsessed with crime fighting. You never want your people to suffer the same trauma. You want them to live a life outside of uh, outside of the trauma that you had. So, did Bruce really want Dick to be that man? No, I don't think no, so. I absolutely <laughs> agree with all of that, and all of that for me works so well in this universe because uh like the comics a lot of the time the nightwing origin story is like batman and robin get into like a huge fight and like just decide that they hate each other and stuff and it's like a really aggressive violent like breaking of that relationship that to me has never really and also sometimes includes barbara and that's like not, yeah. it's not okay uh it's and so like sometimes i'm like i don't get how that works sometimes i'm like i don't get how that just doesn't like that doesn't vibe with me for like what this character and this relationship should be and so when young justice was like batman's a good dad Batman and Nightwing have a, a good, relationship, good relationship and this happened as just the normal result of young people growing up and choosing their own path in their life. I'm like, that 
works. And that's, for me at least, far more relatable and a far more compelling portrayal of that of that growth in that relationship than just being like, one day Nightwing decided to punch his dad in the face. Uh, and I'm like, Wait, why? Why is that what we're going with? For me, that storyline of where Bruce and Dick don't like each other never made sense because I would think you would be grateful to the person that takes you in after you lose your family. And then having that same person give you a life that gives you meaning would be something that people would also be grateful for. So the fact that Bruce and Dick end up fighting and in some storylines, it's because of Barbara. And I never liked the idea of a female character being like the reason why two main characters Two main male characters don't like each other. No. Has never sat well with me because it's just using the female characters. Or something is so gross as the breaking up of a family. It's not great. It's not great because it does stuff like turn Batgirl, who is an amazing, fabulous character all on her own, and turns her into a plot device, which I don't like. Uh, (laughs) And several comics have done it over the years, and I never like it. But No. It's also one of my biggest pet peeves. When animes or shows are so focused on the growth of two main male characters that the female one is, and I'm just thinking of one particular show called (laughs) called Naruto, (laughs) how the main characters, they just go at light speed. And then the female one is just like racing behind them. Like, I'm like, you could have done something with her more than just what she is now. She's Sakura is a great character, um, by my opinion, because she's she did so much on her own. It wasn't, there was no nepotism. There was no type of, like, she worked hard. And yet, people don't give her credit because of some stupid mistakes. Like, I agree, those comments weren't great. But she's a kid. What kid doesn't say stupid stuff? <laughs> and so I think females don't get enough grace in stories because yeah because we're so focused on the male storyline of where does our main male character go that they're willing to sacrifice the female because it's not her story and it's sad because it should be it should be and i think young justice with the females that we have and i complain about mcgann because i hated how her the storyline that she got on season two but i get it now that i'm older she's allowed to make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes and we shouldn't cross her even though i did (laughs) unfortunately we shouldn't banish her just because she made mistakes yeah she's allowed to change she's allowed to regret and she's allowed to come back which is something that superboy did yeah brought her back into the fold into his life and was like i forgive you I understand that you changed and I'm okay with taking the slow again and figuring this out. With that storyline, with McGann's storyline and why I feel like it works really well is that the show season two didn't end with McGann realizing that what she had done was wrong. She realizes that uh, er early enough in season two that we get to see that growth and get to see her try to fix things and get to see her process of setting new boundaries for herself and deciding how do I in some way make up for what I've done, which I think is really powerful and really important with characters making mistakes that hurt other people. Because I feel like a lot of narratives try to go with like, this character realizes they've done wrong and says they're sorry at the end. And that's their big happy ending. And I'm like, well, there is well, that's a good first step. You have to have these characters actually actively trying to make amends for what they've done. And also the fact that they have McGann explicitly say, I know that I don't, I cannot expect you to forgive me and I cannot expect you to let me back into anyone's life or whatever it is, but I am saying I am sorry anyway, which is very important. Like, I love that that's part of her apology to Connor is like, I know that we can that we might never be able to actually be where we were before. And I know that I have no right to ask you to date me again, but I'm still saying I'm sorry. Yeah, that's super important. I find that because it wasn't just an easy 
one and done for me again, that it made it all the more real. Because as a fan, I didn't agree. But as a fan, I can agree that she went about the right way about it. Yeah. I love that she didn't expect Hunter to just bring her back, but he did because you know what? I love this girl. And he did. Yeah. He broke up still loving her. And he very much reminds me of the type of person that I really would like to embody, even though it's, I'm still working on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree that there is, I with Superboy and with kind of looking up to him and who he's become as this character, I absolutely love that along with all of this that we're talking about of like the fact that these characters grow and struggle and change is part of what makes them so relatable on the show is like the fact that Connor starts off season one being just this sad, angsty boy who wants to punch things and wants his super dad to recognize him and appreciate him and goes through all of this stuff and eventually becomes a person who is not only so much calmer and happier in his life, but who is reaching out to other people to kind of give them the support he wishes he had when he was younger. And I feel like that is such a powerful storyline for that kind of character of showing how he has grown into the kind of mentor he would have needed when he was younger is so wonderful. And I think he was lucky enough to have adults let him figure it out for himself. I think so many times in shows we have characters tell other characters how they should act. Yeah. But it's so much more powerful when you let people figure it out for themselves. This show just lets our characters do that, which in, which infers that it it's also letting us change. And I think that's so great about rewatching the show. You find things that you didn't didn't really know that they were there because you didn't have that experience yet. One of the things that I didn't really click on was the fact of how similar me and Artemis are in our family dynamics. I, in my teenage years, grew up with a single mom and it was hard. It was hard because my relationship with my dad wasn't so great at the time, which was also very similar to Artemis. And then now as season three came out, You know, she's living her life, figuring things out. And she has her mom chirping into her ear what she should be doing. (laughs) And it's the same thing. And I'm just like, oh my God, I totally get it now. (laughs) It's just, it's so great. I find that this show just keeps evolving with each watch that you you give it. Yeah. Which is why I love this podcast so much because (laughs) you do all the work for me. (laughs) To be fair, we do, we have many a times when we're like, we've seen this episode eight times and we just realized something. Yeah. We've we've done that a couple of times where we've had stuff that like, we will watch an episode and rewatch an episode and record an episode about it and record more than one episode about it. And then like months later, we're rewatching it and we're, we're like, wait a minute. How did we never notice? But that just shows you the great writing that Greg and Brandon have. Yeah. This show is so layered. So layered. And it's like, you know what? I don't even care that I have to wait a whole year for season four. Yeah. First of all, I had to wait. Was it seven? (laughs) Seven years between season two and three. So I'm okay. Yeah. But like, knowing that this is such great writing and that it's not so one-dimensional makes it worth it and i feel like this is like one of the few shows that i'm gonna be like we should watch this to my kids because i feel like it's so great and i and i hope that they fall in love with it just as much as i did when i first saw it because it really is what i wish the dc extended universe the movie universe would be yeah taking the characters to places that we've never seen them before and not being afraid of pushing them to places that you know we want to see them because we don't get to see it in other mediums because i definitely think we talk a lot about one of our favorite things about young justice from like a comic book fan perspective is how even though this show does so many things that are new to these characters or takes them in different directions they still feel like honest and real portrayals of these characters because sometimes there are those portrayals that are like we're pushing this character to a whole new limit and you're like 
that doesn't feel like that character anymore. Uh, you've pushed them too far. Whereas this show. Or it doesn't feel earned. Or it doesn't feel earned. Yes. Whereas the show yeah. does a fantastic job of placing characters in new situations or pushing them to new limits without losing that heart of the character. Like we talk about like, Robin isn't the leader in season one. And if you're someone who's like familiar with Teen Titans, you're like, that's not right. But the but show. Great about why he can't be. He's too experienced and that's okay. Yeah. The show earns the moment when he becomes the leader and the show earns why he isn't the leader to start with. And it works so well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every choice is backed up and I love it. I love it because it makes it, you know what? You make me agree with you. Yeah. And when you do that, it's it's great. And even when I don't agree, it's still great because then I end up agreeing later on. <laughs> I, just, I just really love it. I really do. This show just has this thing about it that, you know what? The only show that I can think that it's kind of similar to it is Superman and Lois. We've never seen Superman be a dad. And in this show, he gets to be a dad of two teenagers. And the way they figure this out First of all, Lois and Clark's relationship in this show is so awesome because it's like, you can tell that they've been married for a while, that they figured it out, and that the way they argue, it's so perfect because it's like, yes, we're arguing, we're debating about this, but we're not mad at each other. Yeah. If you don't go my way, I'm not going to start, I'm not going to stop talking to you. That's not how this works. This is the new CW show, right? Yeah, it is. And I feel like it just, it just works so well because... Bring Superman to a place where we've never seen him. Same with Young Justice. I've never seen Superman not be the good old Boy Scout. And then you see him and Lois and his sons in a light that, you know what? This is a regular family that just has superpowers. There's nothing special about them besides the fact that they have these struggles that normal people don't have to go through. Yeah. But then you see the struggles that normal people do go through and it's like this is where it works yeah and it's like yeah with young justice even those those struggles that are those things that are not what normal people go through feel like just heightened versions of things that normal people go through if that makes any sense like i feel like so many of the ways that this show that young justice to go back to that explored like people dealing with powers or dealing with like oops my dad got absorbed by the spirit of magic uh that lives in a helmet oh, or, that off that. <laughs> like the way that this show explores those things is through a lens of like how does that emotionally affect someone not just the bare bones like oh how does this superhero science work it's like okay but how would someone feel dealing with that like cyborg's whole plot line in season three of like dealing with how he feels about his dad and whether or not he resents his dad for saving his life in a way that completely changed his life and things like that that are like most people in life, I assume, are not going to have to worry about their consciousness being fused with an evil robot box from another universe. But, like, those... The emotional train wreck, that's something that people go through yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of what makes these characters work so well, is that not just the normal people's struggles attached to these people with powers, but that all of their struggles related to their powers are approached in ways that make them still feel relatable that are like approached through a lens of just what is the emotional impact of this thing that you the viewer will never go through but can understand and sympathize with yeah and speaking of Naboo and Zatara yes the way Naboo after finding out that Naboo might be Vandal Savage's son <laughs> it just makes me think you know what this all makes sense because if Vandal Savage is willing to human traffic his own descendants to apocalypse because he thinks he's doing the right thing for the world then taking over a man's body because he believes chaos is running a rampage and i don't want to be left on a stand for 70 years it's actually a very emotional you know if your dad does that why don't you know i just feel like yeah yeah it makes sense yeah. <laughs> 
so many layers. So, so bad in so many ways. <laughs> yet these people find a way to make it seem like it's okay. <laughs> it's okay that I'm doing this. Vandal Savage is completely convinced uh, that he that he has never done anything wrong, even though he's done a lot wrong. <laughs> and that's wild. He's the great example of a hero living long enough to become a villain. Yeah. That's sad because it's, you know, I get that he was a protect. He comes from a time where people did terrible things. Yeah. So can you ever say he was a hero to begin with? Yeah. That's, these are the questions. These are the questions Young Justice makes us ask. Yeah. <laughs> and then the question of season three of is sacrificing our integrity worth it to save the world? And that, I think, was a question Vandal Savage answered. And he said yes. And our heroes at the end of the season said no. Yeah. It's not. The do the ends justify the means kind of thing. Yeah. It, it does present those. I, I had never really, I don't think it ever clicked for me before that like the Vandal Savage versus the, the whole heroes thing in season three is very much just the two answers to that question. But you're absolutely right. And yeah, the show does it. It asks that question and answers it two different ways and says, which one of these seems like the right way for these characters. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Yeah, Megan, and and by the end of the battle, Megan also kind of answers that question for herself: Is my self worth above saving the world? And she answers no, because we know that when she brain blasts people, she feels guilty and suicidal. And she was like, "Still, I'm gonna do it because this is how we save the world." We prevent the leak from doing bad things. Yeah. And that's a very Batman way of thinking because Batman builds contingency plans for whenever someone goes rogue. How do we put them? How we neutralize them is a way of thinking about it. Yeah. That whole that whole final battle and whole final confrontation is also I think part of what's interesting about that was like that idea was not what McGann jumped to first. Like Calder, if, if I'm remembering correctly, Calder's the one who tells her you need Calder to do this. Older. Yeah. And yeah. she, and because I don't, I think based on like everything we've seen of McGann, that would not have been something McGann would have jumped to because she doesn't trust herself to make that choice anymore. So it's Calder who everybody kind of holds up as like, Calder is the good mom friend moral compass <laughs> kind of a lot of the time and being like, Calder saying, you need to do this. She's like, yep. Okay, I'll I'll do the thing that I don't like doing because the person who is generally right about stuff is telling me that's what I need to do. And I love that Superboy's like jumping towards like, no, that's not the right, that's not the right choice. Yeah, because people who typically you think are right all the time can be wrong. Yeah, too. yeah. And so, um, it may have been right in the moment because the equation was you never thought Halo would get out of it. You didn't think Cyborg was actually going to figure out how to do, you know, there in their situation, that was the right choice because they didn't know that Cyborg was going to come in and be able to free Halo, which then Halo was able to free everybody else. Yeah. (laughs) I think about it and I'm like, I don't blame Calder for coming to that decision. Because yes, you're brain, bra- brain, brain blasting people. Um, you might have to clean up a couple brains <laughs> while you're at it too. Because if you're brain blasting everybody, you got to clean them up. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. But you prevent a cataclysmic event from happening because these people are all way too powerful, and they, and you know, and them falling into the wrong hands is. So bad. And we got an example of that during season two, where it's like they destroyed a, almost a planet because Vandal Savage wanted to prove a point. <laughs> and I'm like, damn it, why do you got to make me jump from one end to the other? <laughs> like, no, I think these guys are great and responsible. And then you think, mind control. And I'm like, we need a failsafe. <laughs> I can't. This is this is this is weird. <laughs> you make me jump back and forth between do I love superheroes or do I think they're too dangerous? But I think what makes all of those 
those situations, those world ending situations that have happened on the show so much more interesting is like that scene where they're trying to decide what they need to do against the league at the end of season three is largely fueled by all of their their personal relationships and stuff like that. That moment, I think if I'm remembering correctly, because I have not watched the very end of season three in a while, but yeah, that conversation after Calder brings that up, the reason Superboy objects is not because of like the high and mighty morals of how do we save the world? It's because he's like, I don't want to see my girlfriend go through that again. I don't want to see her be hurt again. And that very personal, like personal struggle gives that whole thing another layer and makes it so much more interesting than just superheroes arguing over like, what's the right thing to do to save the world and everything. It's Connor being like, yes, I'm a superhero. Yes, I help people and we save the world. But also I am a person with feelings who cares about this other person with feelings and does not want to see them specifically be hurt. And I feel like so many other superhero properties in the world out there don't do that when they should, when those are the moments that make that so much more interesting and that stick in people's heads. Like, I don't, like I genuinely I was like I don't remember all of that fight scene at the very end I don't remember all of the choices they make but I do remember Superboy stopping everyone in a hallway to say no I'm not I don't want to let my fiance get hurt and yeah the show does that all over the place as we have because we have been talking about this whole episode <laughs> so great any other show would have been like Superboy would have been like this is okay I'll help him again when it comes to having to do all this cleanup. But Superboy understands that McGann doesn't like seeing the kind of mental disasters that she can create. Yeah. She did it with Simon, but Simon was a bad guy and she didn't really care for Simon. When she did it to Calder and Calder ended up being a good guy, she was devastated. So devastated because... Now she she hurts someone she loves. And these are people that she loves and she doesn't want to hurt them, but they're going to hurt others. And so this is why she's like, yes, I'm willing to do this because we acknowledge that if they get out of control, nothing's going to be right again. We're going to be in a whole bigger mess and the bad guys are just going to keep winning. Yeah. And it's like cutting off your arm, but you're like, your arm is infected and you need to cut it off to save the rest of your body and you really like your arm though (laughs) so after all of that thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the watchtower rosalyn uh where could people find you on earth prime if they want to hear more of your thoughts about young justice and things so i have an instagram it's trinidad marmolejos it's a mouthful but um, if you type in Rosalind Trinidad, you can find me on Instagram. Cool. It should be like that at, it's a little weird one, but it's both of my last names. I didn't want to be like regular people and use my first name. I'm like, yeah, so people can find me easily. <laughs> <laughs> now it makes it hard. <laughs> but yeah, find me on Instagram if you want to keep talking about you just. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that somehow isn't enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. And if you just tell us that they're there, it makes our lives a whole lot easier. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and even more. And as always, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. 
Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.